If you're wondering what that was, that was our second annual family camp out that we had last weekend. If you missed it, don't worry, we're gonna have another one next year and you can jump in then. My name is Autumn and I'm one of the pastors here at SCG Church. If you're new, we would love to get to know you. So after service, please stop by our Welcome Center in the courtyard to learn what we're all about. Rooted is launching our fall session the week of September 11th. Rooted is the very best way for you to get into community and grow your faith here at SCG. It's a 10 week small group experience on Sunday mornings or Thursday night that will get you connected to God daily through Bible reading and prayer and will kickstart you in building strong friendships with other Christians. God has used this program to literally transform the lives of so many in our church and we want you to experience it too. We have volunteers on the patio to answer all of your questions, so stop by and say hi. If you're looking to take the next step in your faith journey, we're having baptisms during our Sunday service next weekend. If you're interested, you must attend our baptism class after service in the CLC this Sunday. If you're a guy, pay attention. We are kicking off the next season of men's ministry on August 27th, Saturday morning from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. at SCG and the New Community Life Center. We will have a great speaker, games, and incredible food. Learn what it means to live the good life, a life with purpose. If you're just checking out God, have been following him for a long time, or just wanna meet other guys, this is the event for you. Food will include bacon, sausage, eggs, and gourmet pancakes. Don't eat too much though, because there will also be a putting and shipping competition. For those of you who are looking for ways to support the work God is doing here at SCG, thank you. You can continue to give online or in person at the black offering boxes on your way out. Oh, and after service today, if you wanna hang out and meet some people, go ahead and head on out to the kids' building. Right in front of the kids' building, we're gonna be having some delicious bacon grilled cheese that you can sit down and eat with some family and friends. Lastly, if you are in need of prayer, please come down front after service. We have folks down there who would love to meet you and pray for you. There's always a lot going on here at SCG that you can be a part of. So make sure you stay up to date on what's coming up by checking out all the tables on the courtyard, following us on our social media pages, and visiting us on our website at scgchurch.org. Well, good morning, Seacoast Grace. It is so good to see you here this morning. You look good. Come on and stand up on your feet. Oh, I want you to turn around and wave at somebody and say, it's so good to see you here today. is mine Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine Heir of salvation Purchase of God Born of His Spirit Oh, I'm washed in His blood oh.
was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. Cause he opened the prison doors and he parted the raging seas. My God, he holds a victory. Can you help me say? Oh, hey. 
it up today. Come on. You made the way over and over and over again. You made a way. You just keep on making a way, God. You made a way. Don't know how, but you did it. standing here just because God made a way. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you. Thank you that you always make a way. You make a way every time, God. And so we're grateful. We're, we're just filled with joy this morning that we get to come into this room, into this place with other believers and to worship your name and to praise you. God, will you bless us as we bless you? We lift our hearts to you and we lift our minds to you. Will you continue to bless us and pour out your love to us? We need it. We live in a dark world and as we walk into this place today to worship we left a dark world outside but we came into the light and so we thank you that you are the light we praise you and we give you glory for it all in your name we pray amen you may be seated Hey guys, how are you? Welcome. So you're probably wondering what I'm doing out here in the middle of a vineyard. Yeah, it's a vineyard. And I'm here to tell you about something Jesus taught uh, about wine. And yeah, I don't drink wine, but it teaches some great lessons. So check this out. Hey, you guys, how you doing? You're probably wondering where I am. Well, today's a special day. You know, we were supposed to have a special guest, and that didn't work out. And so uh, I thought I'd do something fun, at least for the first half of my sermon. And so I'm here in a vineyard, an actual vineyard here, and uh, it with actual grapes. Look at this. Check this out. I'll just pull these off here. Look at this. Look at that. They're about a month from being ripe uh, for harvest, but actually they're pretty good. I don't want to eat them right now because I'd spit the seed out on camera. That's gross. But, but uh, anyway, so I'm in a vineyard. Why am I in a vineyard? Well, there's this wonderful thing about Jesus. He talks about, he talks about wine skins. He talks about new wine, old wine, wine skins. I've looked all over this vineyard and I can't find a wine skin anywhere. But there are some barrels. I'll talk about that in a minute. But anyway, here's what I want to talk about today. I want to set this down over here. Here's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about that sometimes I'm just kind of in a mode. And lately I've kind of been in this mode where it's, uh, I don't know, whether it's advertising or it's, the political stuff, spin that's going on things, or, or it's somebody trying to teach me a self-help, six ways to be whatever. And I just, I just have this mindset. It's like, I just can't. 
I, with with that today, with you today, I just can't. I just can't. I don't know. It's because I'm old and I've seen so many empty promises and and I've seen so many false schemes to try to make life work or whatever it is. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But there is a time I think where we kind of come to the end of of kind of how we've been doing things, how we've been thinking about things, how we've been approaching things. We kind of come to the end of that and we realize that um, it's not working. Something new needs. I you know I look at our country. I. I look at so many marriages and failed marriages and families, and I just go, but it's not working. At what point do we realize this isn't working? And if we keep doing the same old thing the same old way, we're going to get the same results. Is it a time we step up to a new kind of, a new kind of opportunity, a new kind of results, a new kind of capacity or possibility for our lives? And I want to talk about a passage, and, and it's found in Matthew, and it's it's uh, Matthew 9, and it's right on the heels of, of Jesus calling Matthew, who was not a good guy. He was a tax collector and a cheat, basically, and he hung around with the same kinds of people. And um, yeah, I want to talk about a couple things in this first half of the sermon. In, the, in this thing, the, what happens is he, he gets these kind of not good guys, and and the religious types thought they were bad people, and he hangs out with these bad people. He calls them to follow him. He has dinner with them, and these are kind of not the kind of people the religious types think you ought to be hanging out with. And so they start giving him grief, and Jesus says some weird things to him. You know, like, uh, I, I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. He wasn't saying the religious types were healthy. He was saying they didn't rec- recognize they were sick, but We'll cover that in a moment. And then he gets down to the end. And, and, and this weird thing happens because now uh, uh, John's disciples have come and said, why aren't you fasting? We're all fasting. And he says some really interesting things. He says, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he's with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they'll fast. By the way, interesting reference, bridegroom, wedding. There's another wine teaching that Jesus has or miracle that Jesus says. We'll talk about in the second half of the sermon. Just remember that one. And then here's the one I want to get to. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. I'm here in a vineyard at a winery. I don't actually even drink alcohol, but the process is interesting to me. And... uh, and, and I was thinking about this, this new wine and new wineskins. So Jesus has just called Matthew to follow him. And he says, uh, Matthew, come and, and follow me. And he's telling, he's telling Matthew and the others that your life is going to change. And so what Jesus didn't call him to was what the religious types would have called him to. So the religious types would have said, Matthew, clean up your act. Get your act together. Stop the mess around. Stop the cheating. Stop working for the Romans. And then you'll be okay with God. You kind of earn brownie points with God. What Jesus is calling him to is not a a different kind of life, not a set of rules, but a relationship. We've heard that a lot in the church, relationship and not rules. But it's really interesting. Jesus not only is calling him to a relationship with himself, he's saying that in that relationship, some some unbelievable things are going to happen. Some really good things are going to happen. Some expanding things are going to happen. So the story of wine and wineskins. What they would do in, in, in the old world is they would take a goat. Uh, they would skin it, take the skin of it, clean it out real good, sew it back up, and just leave one opening, usually the neck, and then they would put the wine in it for it to ferment. And as it fermented, um, it would expand. And because the skin was fresh and, and pliable, it would expand with it. And the picture he's painting is, what if you took that new wine, put it in an old wine skin that had no, no elasticity left in it at all, and it started to ferment and expand. It would destroy the skin, the wine, the whole thing. His picture is this. The rule keepers, the religious types, uh, types were too busy keeping the rules to see that Jesus had come to offer something better. He offered something better than the rules. He offered himself. He said, I have come that you can have life and have it abundantly or have it more than you've experienced. And so when the religious religious guys came and they came after him, he's like, no, no, you don't get it. You're too stuck in your old ways. You're too stuck in the rule keeping. Even John's disciples, you're too stuck in the rules to recognize I'm offering you something better, a relationship. It's kind of how I feel sometimes. I look around the world and and I even look at my own problem-solving techniques or whatever tendencies and and I realize wait a minute though you don't need a a, 
one of the old techniques. You don't need one of the old ways of thinking. You don't need the old mindset of scarcity or, or limited potential or fear or whatever. You need to be with Jesus. Because when you're with Jesus, your mind expands and he can do things that you never dreamed of. The Bible says that he can do more than we ever dreamed of or we could possibly imagine. He can do that kind of stuff. But you gotta you gotta throw it. So you gotta reject the old ways. You gotta reject the old wineskins. You gotta open yourself up to God saying, I'm gonna do more than you ever dreamed of, but you're gonna have to do it my way. The, the religious leaders weren't willing to do that. They were stuck in the rule keeping thing. They figured they got that down. They're going to justify themselves before God. And so they're going to stick with that. But the problem is that it was the sinners who were going to get it. Here's what it, 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 it basically said. Religious types, you think you got it all figured out? Do it your way. It's not going to work out, but do it your way. You sinner types, you who will admit that you're in trouble, you who are struggling, if you reject your old ways which were bad. They weren't working for you. And you recognize that. Even though religious types, they're not working either, but they won't recognize it. If you reject your old ways, I'll do new wine. I'll pour a new life into you, new potential, new opportunity, new peace, new joy, new love, all this stuff that we all want on the deepest levels. So he says, come to a relationship, reject, reject the old stuff. Uh, and, and then I'm going to do something, something really good. So, Here's, here's what this is really about. All of us want to self-justify. All of us want to figure our own stuff out. Even if we don't believe there's a God, what do we do when something bad happens? Well, that's not fair. Well, what does fair have to do with anything? If there's no God and there's no justice in the world, there, there's no ideal even to aspire to, why would I say it's unfair? Because deep inside we know there's some kind of power behind the universe. And so we want to justify. See, here's how we believe. We just automatically believe there are good people in the world and bad, bad people in the world. Two types of people, good people, bad people. And somehow we always land on the good side. Yeah, we're not perfect to, to err as human, but you know, mine aren't so bad. I have little bad things that I do. Other people have big bad things and mine aren't so big. But what if we stop trying to self-justify? What if we stop trying to say, I'm not so bad, or I'm good. Say the left does it, the right does it, the left does it. I'm very open-minded, I'm very accepting, and the right says, but I'm keeping traditional values, and yeah, yeah. And the truth is, we need to, all of us need to stop self-justifying, like the Pharisees, and like the sinners, we need to humble ourselves and say, yeah, I don't have this figured out. See, that's when the new wine comes. The new wine comes, we're finally able to say, you know what, our speaker a couple of weeks ago, they lost his wife and it's an amazing story. But, he, but there was an interesting thing he said that let me know that he knew he was still in process. He said, I'm a dumpster fire. And I thought that may be the truest thing everybody in this room. Yours may be because of a terrible incident that happened in your life, an awful and a difficult future with all those kids. But the truth is you are a dumpster fire, and so am I. And so is the one sitting next to me, the one sitting next to them. We are dumpster fire. See, there are two kinds of people in the world, not good and bad, because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We're all messed up. We're all a dumpster fire. The two kinds of people are the proud, the Pharisees, too proud to admit it, and the humble who admit the truth. I'm a dumpster fire. You're a dumpster fire. I need Jesus. And whether I'm struggling with my attitude on a given day or I'm struggling trying to figure out what the next step is for a ministry or, or whatever it might be, if I will start at the foot of the cross, acknowledging my dumpster fireness, <laughs> acknowledging that I can't self-justify, I can't, I can't rationalize away my struggles and I can't find the right answer. See, the answers are not something you Google search. It's someone you come to know and in coming to know that person of Jesus Christ, I can admit the truth about me and then he is free to pour a new wine, a new opportunity, a new mindset, a fresh look at the world on me. See, I don't think this happens just for old guys like me who've seen a lot and struggled to not be cynical about it. I think it happens for young people. I think about when I was back in high school. Back in high school, all about being popular and having a good time and not worrying about the headache tomorrow or the repercussions necessarily. But somewhere along at the end of my high school time, I began to realize that, you know what? This isn't working. This isn't working. I could be the most popular kid in the world and I could have all this stuff. At the end of the day, I don't really like who I am and I'm not really sure where I'm going and I'm... I'm kind of over it. I need new wine. I need a new life perspective. I need a new empowerment. I need a new purpose. 
I remember a few years later when we were on staff at a church, things were going well. I was doing a good job, frankly. And uh, nice house, cars, the whole. And I just felt like, you know what? I feel like I am stuck in this structure. I am stuck in this job, in this position. It's a good one, it's a great one, but it's not the one that I think God wants. And that's when I picked up my family, two little kids, moved to the West Coast, not knowing what was gonna happen, but it was a new wine. It wasn't, it wasn't just silly, it was God prompting me to let go of the old so that he could do something new. Lately, I've been feeling that same urgency. Sometimes it has to do with our character development, our behavior, our habits. Sometimes it has to do with uh, mission or employment or whatever. And lately, I just feel like I, I need to experience a fresh vision of God, a fresh understanding of his goodness in order to share with people who are chasing after the old things, chasing after all the old things that I've found from experience and for observation don't work. Quit chasing after the old things. Let go of the old things. Reject the old things in favor of a new wine, in favor of becoming the new creation that God has for me. Yeah, let's all quit pretending to have it all together. Let's pre quit pretending that either we or our favorite political party or politician or even preacher has the answers. Let's just all say, no, I don't. Let's just stop. Let's just stop pretending and just admit the truth. I, I'm a dumpster fire. I'm struggling, whether it's emotionally or financially or something. I don't know everything. And I need to go back to the one who does, back to Jesus, and ask for new wine. A few weeks ago, a few weeks ago I, I mentioned it. We did a song, and then I mentioned another song on the same album that really touched me. Over the last few weeks, I've been, uh, I've been thinking about it. I've been in some scenery very much like this and had some time to think. And as I look out over God's creation and what man's done with it, which is pretty cool in some cases, I mean, realize I need something beyond myself. <laughs> Interesting story. I couldn't find uh, any wineskins on, on at the, the winery here, but I found oak barrels. And, uh, and, and the cellar master is a friend of mine who's telling me that oak barrels, how often you use these? Well, it depends on how good a wine you want. If you're going to make really great, great wine, they use them once because the oak contributes a certain flavor to the wine. I don't know, I don't drink it, but it sounds interesting. Buttery, I think was the word I heard. But if you don't care and you just want mediocre wine, you can use them repeatedly. Eventually, there are some people who are so cheap, just want to sell cheap wine, they just use them over and over again, long after it's contributed anything to their life. They're using these old barrels. Some people are so cheap, they don't even use oak barrels, they just throw a chunk of oak, a piece of wood in a big metal tank, and hope it wears off on it a little bit. Some of us are like that with our Christianity. We're just throwing a little God in there, hoping it fixes it. <laughs> Some of us, we've been in the same old, same old, and we think God's done with this. Or God doesn't have a next step for us, but he does. Why keep using the same barrel? If this is the one life on this earth I get, I want to squeeze all the flavor. I don't want just a plain Jane, bland life. I want all the flavor, all the adventure, all the blessings that God has for me and nothing less. Some of us need to throw out the barrels. We need to get some new barrels and some new wine and have a new experience with God. And let the next season of our life to be fruitful and beautiful and full of flavor and adventure and experiencing God's calling. And so I'm going to ask Nick, okay, I've already asked Nick, <laughs> to come and sing this song. And while he sings this song, I want you to think about it. Is there, a, is there a place in your life that you're stuck? You're trying to get some new flavor out of some old barrels? Some putting, trying to put some new, fresh understanding of God in some old wineskins? What do you need to break down? What do you need to let go of so that God can speak newness, life, growth into you today? Let go of them. Let go of them during this song. Listen.
When you got wounds that haven't healed, I did it my way. Now let's do it your way. I think it's time for a holy new wine. Because my thirsty soul's way. So um, when we heard that guest speaker had canceled on us and I was out of town, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to do something different, something fun. And, uh, and besides that, I got to hang out in some beautiful country. So I uh, hope you were, uh, allow me to do that. So <clears throat> one of the things I'm realizing is that so much of what the world we live in, the conventional wisdom of the world we live in, offers is just empty. It's just completely empty. And even those things that uh, are true in terms of techniques and abilities to address different issues in life fall short. And uh, part of what Jesus was trying to teach the uh, religious types uh, in the midst of the sinners and, 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 uh, and, and uh, the outcasts is that even if you can pull off what you're trying to pull off, it's, pro- it's not of eternal value. It's not an ultimate kind of thing. So all of the things that we are taught and all the self-help movement and all the techniques and the get ahead and all this stuff, it, even if you could do all that it says you can do, it's not what you were made to do. Because what you were made to do is have a relationship with the eternal God, to have an impact for the eternal God, to enjoy a relationship with God. And without that, none of the other stuff adds up, even if you could pull it off. And by the way, you can't pull it off. Any more than the Pharisees could live perfect rule-keeping lives. And so one of the things I want to um, maybe help us think about a little bit today is that if you're pulling your life off, you're not aspiring to enough. If you think you got this thing wired, you're not aspiring to much. You know what I'm saying? Because the things we're supposed to aspire to have such eternal value that you couldn't possibly pull them off. 
And that once you get into the flow of what God wants to do in your life, you begin to get involved in seeing people's lives change for eternity, seeing impact that matters forever. You begin to realize how, how much what you've been doing pales in comparison. Think about the disciples. Think about Matthew. Here are all the religious types. They're just, they're, they've got reputation in their community. We're the upstanding types. We're the rule keepers. Look at us. We're well-respected in society. Here's Matthew. He's a tax collector. He rips his own people off. He's an outcast. He can't even go to the temple. He is the bottom of the heap. Who is it we're talking about now? In a good way. We're talking about both of them, but we're not too proud of the Pharisees. We love what happened with Matthew. Imagine being a part of seeing someone's life change like Matthew's life was changed. But we've got to get out of our own way. We've got to let God work in us. And it's not a, I don't know how to explain this. It's, it's not a, it's a life-giving way. It's a, it's a sustaining way. It's a fresh way. It's a, it's a daily kind of interaction with him that allows us to walk into life as a great adventure. Not a to-do list, not a dutiful list, but an opportunity. What is God, what are you going to do today that's beyond my ability to even anticipate what it is? I believe that's what we're supposed to be living. And frankly, I believe that's what the world needs right now. I think anything less is insufficient to deal with the issues the world's dealing with. I just got a text from a friend in Africa. Uh, the, the Ukraine situation is going to cause such a shortage of food in Africa. They're anticipating millions starving. I'm thinking... Our, our, the UN can't fix that. Um, our diplomatic corps can't fix that. We're going to have to try to jump in and help, but what we need is a revival. <laughs> and that God would begin to address the evil in men's hearts that cause us to kill each other, to want each other, what each other has. You see, we need something supernatural. And it's not just on a global scale, it's on a personal scale. I was looking at some stuff this week and I'm like, I just cannot pull this off. And then I remembered, oh yeah, I know God. I don't have to pull this off. I don't even have to figure this out. I just got to be obedient and trust him in faith. And by the way, he pulled it off in a miraculous way that I couldn't have predicted or anticipated. So let me just give you some things to think about in light of this. First of all, we need to consistently, constantly be on guard against the old ways the old ways of thinking, the old patterns, whether it's I'll roll up my sleeves and I'll fix it myself, or it's I, I'm a victim because I've been taken advantage of, or it's somebody else's fault, whatever your stuff is. The religious stuff, the leader's stuff was they, they thought they could keep the rules and impress God. But you've got stuff. I've got stuff. And it just doesn't work. We need to be constantly on guard against the old structures because the old structures will crack under the pressure of the new world that we're moving into. Our old beliefs, if they aren't based on Scripture and a relationship with God, they will restrict what God wants to do through us and limit our perspectives. Our, the old paradigms, the old methodologies become brittle and eventually become self-serving and obsolete. And we've got to break out of those and make sure we're living according to truth, the living word, and an ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ. Romans 12, 2, very familiar passage. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's perfect will is. The reality is, um, if I continue to live according to the patterns of this world, the conventional wisdom of this world, my life is, is not going to be what I've always wanted it to be, what God has intended it to be. I've got to break away from those old patterns of thinking well, how do you do that? Well, first, you've got to start by identifying them. A prayer I've been praying lately is, God, help me see me as you see me. Because I can do one of two things. I can see me the way most of the world sees themselves. They kind of wink at their own sin, or write it off as not as bad as somebody else, and they, I'm, I'm a good person, as I talked about earlier. Or the other way I can look at myself is, I am worthless. I am no good. I am not valuable at all. And neither of those are the way that God looks at me. Not at all. When God looks at me, he sees my stuff. He sees my wrong patterns of thinking, my wrong behaviors, my wrong feelings, my, even my wrong aspirations. He sees those. And yet he also sees a person that he created, knit me together in my mother's womb, and his intention for me to live a potential that I can't even dream of. He sees all of that at the same time. He rarely shows me all of this over here. But if I'll ask him, he'll show me this over here. He'll help me see myself objectively. 
Lord, show me where I'm, I'm falling into old patterns, patterns of this world thinking, where I'm looking at, at problems with just limited resources that this world has, forgetting that you have all the resources we could ever need, and you're already up to something in this process that I haven't even figured out yet. Help me to stop thinking this way. Help me learn to fully trust you in faith. Lord, if I'm carrying with me old patterns, that, you know, family of origin stuff, and you know, some of us just, our instincts are just wrong. All of us, our instincts are wrong, some more obvious than others. If I'm just living by instincts, by conventional wisdom of the world, or of a dysfunctional family I was raised in, God needs to point that out to me. God needs to help me see objectively that that's not true. That's, that's under the sun kind of thinking. That's patterns of this world kind of thinking. God, where is that happening in my life? Please show it to me so that I can be on guard against it. With the help of your Holy Spirit, I can root out those ways of thinking and looking at the world. As I think about what God wants me to aspire to, he wants me to... Um, be different. You see, when, when, when Matthew was called, he was called to follow Jesus. But in order to follow Jesus, he had to leave tax collecting. For him to try to keep tax collecting and try to follow Jesus would be the epitome of an old wineskin. See, some of us want to keep our old attitudes, our old bitterness, our old anger, our old addictions, our old stuff, and add Jesus in. It's not going to work. It's going to leave you broken and bitter because you think Jesus didn't work. You think he didn't do his job. When in reality, you never left. When he calls us, he calls us to himself away from something. And if you try to hang on to both, it won't work. You try to hang on to both, the old will win. And you'll think Jesus isn't who he said he is. But you didn't really try. You didn't really try him for who he is. You didn't really test him out. You didn't really do it his way. You did it your way and asked him to bless it. Now, see, this is a southern church. You'd have been all over that, but uh, <laughs> somebody would have said amen or something. Yeah. I'm going to Charleston next week. They'll say amen. Uh, God wants us to reject secondhand faith. He wants us to experience him, him for ourselves. He wants us to reject secondhand faith, third-rate dreams, and low-risk endeavors. See, a lot of us, our lives have kind of boiled down to that. We're trusting that God is there because somebody else told him we haven't really experienced him for ourselves. Well, why not? It's not his problem. He's available. We settle for less than kinds of dreams, less than what God intended for us. Well, you don't know the disadvantage. You don't know. God does. He still has plans for you. Well, that's scary. <laughs> yep. What else are you going to do? Just coast it out till you die? Come on. You are created for more than that. I was created for more than that. I need to be on guard against the old ways. I need the Holy Spirit to shine a light, a bright light into my soul so that I can see when those things crop up and I can eliminate them and I can be called away from them so I can experience the thing I'm being called to. I can be expandable for the kingdom's sake. Now you're getting it. Now you're getting it. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to say amen at this one and I wouldn't encourage you to necessarily but I wrote this, this sentence this week it's time to stop complaining and start ministering I want you to think about that a second I want you to apply that to your personal life I want you to apply that to the nation we live in the community you live in it's time to stop complaining yeah we all get it we all see the same stuff. You don't have to point it out anymore. We get it. We can do about it. I don't know what to do. You're right. You don't know what to do. That's why you need fresh wine. That's why you need the power of the Holy Spirit because God knows what to do about it and he'll do it through you if you will let him. But it's risky. It requires faith. And yet that's what he came to do. See, we don't have to say Christians, have, I think, in this country, I, 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 I don't know, I, stewing Christians, I think, is what we've got. A bunch of people just sit around stewing. It's all going to hell in a handbasket, literally. It is, it is. <laughs> and I just, and I, I feel that way sometimes too, but I just want to go, so why are you here? Why are you here? God created me to stew. I'm a stewer.
what is that? God didn't create you to stew. He created you to be a man or woman of faith. To like the disciples where you went, people got healed, lives were changed, things got upset. The status quo was turned upside down and the world was literally changed. That's what, that, that's what I want to do. I'm just stewing, I've had it with that. I want to do this. I want to be over here. But it's not something I can do. It's something I can only open my heart to and say, God, pour new wine in here. Bring a fresh vision of you. I want to be a new creation. I want to be expandable for the kingdom and whatever it is, whatever part you have me play. If you just want me to haul water to the battlefield, I'm good for it. I just want to be a part of what you're doing in the world. Be on guard against the old stuff. Realize what you're called to. Be expandable for that. And lastly, and I think this is the biggest one, some of you don't trust the winemaker. Let me rephrase it. All of us, at times, don't trust the winemaker. But if I don't worry about this, <laughs> if I don't figure this one out, if I don't manipulate, maneuver, and get this, who's going to do it? <laughs> God. He will. There's this great story. It's in John chapter 2, in verse 10 verses there. And uh, Jesus goes to a wedding with his family, and his mom calls him out. They ran out of wine. His mom's like, oh, talk to Jesus. He can fit. Now, how did his mom know that? So amazing things must have happened in Jesus' life, right? She knew something special about Jesus. I mean, his birth alone was kind of unusual. <laughs> so she probably had a hint right there. And she says, oh, no, talk to Jesus. And Jesus is like, no, mom, mom, well, you know how moms are. Mom! Tell the servants to fill up the barrels with water and uh, he turns them into wine and he says to one of the servants who by the way the servant at this point is like because none of the guests knew what happened and so he takes the guy in charge of the party he says, he says take, take to the guy in charge the guy in charge of the party he goes whoa <laughs> because most people serve the best wine up front, and then after people have had too much, they serve the cheap stuff. Right? That's what he says. But you have saved the best wine for last. If Jesus made wine, what kind of wine would he make? The best. That's what kind of wine Jesus makes. The best. You think you can't trust him with your stuff? He makes the best wine. A wedding in the ancient world is probably a three to five day affair. So they've been, they've been at this for a while. He brings this wine. He brings the best wine. And then in verse 11, there's an interesting thing happens. After he tells the servants to take the wine to the guy in charge of the party and tell him, oh, that's really, that's great wine. Comes back. And uh, it says a powerful thing there. I was, thinking about, I was thinking about all the people at the party and, and what they thought going home. They thought, the, the, the regular folks didn't know what happened. They thought, what a great, what a great party. And the servants were thinking, what a great trick. <laughs> or maybe, what a great wine. You know what the disciples said? It says in verse 11, and the disciples believed. You know what they went away thinking? What a great savior. Now, see, we can do the same thing about Christianity. We can come to church and say, that was a good party. I did music. That was cool, kind of uplifting, kind of encouraging. That's good. Or we can even say, you know what, God, I could, I could use some God tricks in my life right now. I have a friend who calls them God shots. Pardon the pun. <laughs> little God shots. There's really cool little tricks in my life once in a while. Or you could go away going, oh, my goodness. What a great Savior. Not just a savior of my eternal soul, but a savior of my day, of my week, of this situation, of this relationship. When I can't figure it out, I can't work it out, I can't make it turn out. When all of that happens, I can trust him and he can be the savior of that thing. What a great savior. But I've got to open myself up, put aside the old, the self-sufficiency, and, and put it aside and just realize God is able. And God is good. 
He makes good wine. He makes good lives. I read this recently. This is a counterproductive or counterintuitive for many of us about our Christianity. It says, it is a Christian's duty to be as happy as they possibly can be. So you've got a Savior who makes great wine. He says that he came. Here's his mission statement for life, by the way. You may not know this. He came, in, in John 10, 10, I came that you might have life and have it fully. Not a halfway life, not a scared life, not a beaten down life, but have life fully. And whatever your situation is, being as happy as you possibly can, I think is according to God's will. Matter of fact, Augustine said that we are to know God, to word, glorify God, and to enjoy him forever. I can think of nothing more joyful than going on a great adventure where God has surprises for me at every corner, wonderful surprises. I think that's who we're supposed to be. I think that's how we're supposed to live. Yeah, I've heard enough of this stuff going on in the world. I see it. I get it. But I know something better. I know a God who makes great wine. I know a God who builds great lives. I know a God who who can build great marriages and great families and cause great impact through your life. If you'll open yourself up and say, I want every day, I want that fresh wine. I want to be that new creation. I'm getting a little stiff and brittle in my outlook. I'm getting a little stuck in my methodology. Break it up. Loosen it up so I can be expandable for the kingdom. Today, I, I guess I would just kind of think about this. If we serve so great a God, why are we so mediocre in so many ways? All of us. We have mediocre minds, mediocre attitudes. Connie and I have been saying since COVID, the United States operated at about a C minus. Every restaurant you go to, any, I know, they're overworked, I get it. It's still a C minus. And the problem is my attitude is about a D plus on most days. Unless I, that morning, sit down with God and say, break up the anger, break up the bitterness, break up the disappointment or cynicism, break it up. I want new wine. So I had, I, sometimes I have, I have dumb thoughts, weird dumb thoughts. And so I was finishing that video and the beautiful, uh, the, there was a lake, I was, as I was talking to the camera, by the way, there was a squirrel walking right up to one of the cameramen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking he's going to get a surprise if the thing goes between his legs. Anyway, and so, and behind them is this beautiful lake, and there was this white crane that kept flying and landing and flying. And I'm just in there, and I just wanted to do one of those, like, yay God moments kind of things, you know? And uh, I had this weird thought. I didn't grow up in a family. We drank alcohol. I, I don't drink alcohol. But, and so the idea of raising a glass to someone is kind of weird because you don't really do it with sweet tea. Um, and, and I just thought, you know what? I just feel like like raising a glass to God for his creation of the world and of me and for sending his son to die. And then I remembered, oh yeah, we do. It's called communion. So today I'd like us to do communion and just say, as we drink this cup, ours happens to be orange juice, but I mean uh, grape juice, but I want to remember and be grateful to the God who is, who did, who will. And I want that new wine in my life. Would you join me in that today? Could we do that together? If you didn't get communion when you came in, raise your hand. The ushers will hand it out. I'm going to invite Corey out. I want Corey to sing a song, and he's going to sing part of the song. And then we're going to take communion. Then we're going to finish it together. And we're going to celebrate uh, the God who makes great wine and who does great works in us.
Take the bread and the cup. You'll hold the bread while I read a passage, say a prayer over it. Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, today we remember. We remember that you gave your life, you gave your body so that our lives could be different so that we could have a different kind of life, a different opportunity, potential, a life that is of eternal value, a life that is forgiven and free. So today we remember and we take the bread together. Let us take the bread. the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes Lord Jesus we remember 
that you died because it was only your death that could pay for all the wrongdoing of all humanity. But in paying for our sins, for all that we've ever done wrong, you freed us to be different, to experience a new life, to be a new creation, to operate according to a new wisdom, a divine plan beyond anything that the world or the patterns of this world could initiate or even understand. And so today, Lord God, we remember the shedding of blood, the forgiveness of our sin, and we thank you. Let us take the cup together. Let's stand together and sing the rest of this song, shall we? Have you had a good time today? Have you, have you felt Jesus in this place? Yes. Well, you know what? Let's leave today. Let's be new wine. Let's be a new flame. You know, I live, I live in an area that is uh, prone for fires. 
And what the Holy Spirit does is kind of like a pilot on a stove. And I hope today you got a little pilot light to take a flame out of here and take it into the world and serve God. God bless you. Have a good week.